Florida. Beaches. Oranges. Exotic animals. Humans doing human things. Deluxe accommodations. And transportation. Why, you can go anywhere you want, but watch out. You might end up in outer space. Closer to Earth, this adventurous person is preparing to ride his bicycle across the state from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Nearly 250 miles of all the goodness Florida can offer. But you may be asking, is he of sound mind? Does he plan appropriately? Is he equipped with the best maps and latest technology? Probably not. So who knows what he will encounter. Farewell, sir, and happy pedaling. Okay, look, a really quick intro because I'm leaving early tomorrow morning for a nearly thousand mile drive to Titusville to begin my coast to coast trip. So if you're not familiar with this trail, it is to date about 88% complete and will be somewhere around 250 miles when all is said and done. And it connects Titusville with St. Petersburg. So like a lot of really great state trails, it's a collection of a lot of local trails. In fact, I read that Florida currently has 9,200 miles of trails, which I find uh, unbelievable, but more on that later. What I'm really looking forward to on this ride is the chance to see and experience more of the interior of the state. You know, the coasts are obviously beautiful, uh, but the inland areas are really a different side to the state that most visitors, myself included, just don't enjoy nearly enough. I got a little taste of this during my ride back in March of this year, and it was that that prompted me to look into other Florida trails, and well, I found the Coast to Coast route. Okay, enough for now. I'll see you in the morning. It's early, but you know what? It's never too early to add a new segment to our Ride Along Adventures portfolio. I'm getting ready to drive about a thousand miles and I thought I would use the distance to expand our minds. Is that okay? It's gonna be fun, just trust me, play along. Okay, demonstration one. If you don't already know, the sun is huge. It's really huge. In fact, over 1.3 million Earths could fit inside the sun. It's that big. But for demonstration purposes, let's say we could shrink the sun down to the size of a golf ball. We're going to move to the kitchen so we can see this a little bit easier. The simple question is this. How far would Earth be from the sun if the sun were this size? So look, come on, get a number in your head. I'll wait. Actually, the Earth would be about 15 feet away. And unlike this picture, it would be smaller than a grain of sand in size. Because at this perspective, we could barely even see it. As you can tell, this is a huge distance, and yet we feel the apricity, apricity of its warmth on a cold winter day, and our skin will even burn if we face it for too long. Okay, demonstration number two is gonna have to wait until the sun comes up and we get going. I'm packed up, ready to go, and ready 
for demonstration number two. So let's keep the sun at that same size. It's just gonna hang out there in the kitchen like it was before. The question now is, how far would we have to drive to get to the edge of our solar system? Come on, play along. How far? Okay, did you guess 0.6 miles? If you did, you're right. 0.6 miles to get out here to the orbit of Pluto. Yes, Pluto. I'm not throwing Pluto out of the solar system. I think that was mean-spirited. I mean, Pluto's irregular, but what better symbol for our solar system than an irregular planet? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, so remember, we're talking about scale here. The sun is that little golf ball. 0.6 miles back there floating around in the kitchen. So for any good Plutonian looking up in the night sky, all they see is another little dot. The sun doesn't look really any different than another star in the night sky, maybe slightly brighter. So think about the strength of gravity. Even though we couldn't even see it and discern it as anything other than a normal star in the night sky, it still exerts enough gravity to keep Pluto in orbit around the solar system. Amazing. Okay, now here's where we're gonna get serious. The third demonstration, and this is a big question, so I really want you to think about this one. 0.6 miles to the end of our solar system. How far will we have to drive to get to the next closest star? That star's name is Proxima Centauri, and it's about the same size as our sun. So it's another golf ball sitting out there somewhere, according to our model. So come up with a number. How far are we gonna have to drive? You ready? Let's go. when I first heard this question this was my guess 50 miles so if you if you're out if you're 50 miles or less right now I will give you a chance to update your number got one okay 67 miles is not the answer settle some unfinished business. If you remember my video from riding the Delmarva Peninsula, I got all the way down here to the end of the peninsula and they would not let me go out and enjoy the very end. But now that I'm in a car, I can. <laughs> A mile from where they turned me around. For 25 minutes to Diamond Springs Road. <laughs> I mean, I biked the entire length of the peninsula and then they turned me around. Oh well, there it is. There's the end. <laughs> okay, unfinished business is now finished. Hey, it's uh, 226 miles right now. Are you beginning to wonder just how far this other golf ball is going to be? Are you beginning to like get puzzled? Yep, we're not there yet.
just pulled off the highway at 750 miles, conveniently at a Cracker Barrel. By the way, when the history of the, the universe is unfolded someday, I think people are going to be surprised at how significantly Cracker Barrel plays into that story. <laughs> I've taken a lot of heat and derision over the years of my love for Cracker Barrel. Now look, I'm not going to go in there and buy a fuzzy cat sweater, but you know, I think it's good eating. Focus, Brian, focus! Okay, 750 miles. We have arrived at Proxima Centauri. And again, remember, at our scale of 750 miles, Proxima Centauri is a golf ball. Just like that golf ball floating in the kitchen at home in Delaware right now. That's the next nearest star. Did your mind explode yet? No? <laughs> I'm gonna give you one last chance. If you were alive in 1977, you, got, you may have gotten a chance to witness the um, launch of Voyager 1. Probably one of the most ambitious science projects ever conceived. It's phenomenal. It has fundamentally changed the way that we think about the solar system. It, and by the way, it's still out there. It's still active. It's hurtling through space at about 38,000 miles an hour. But anyway, okay, we talked about distance, 750 miles. Let's talk about time a little bit. You know, yesterday at our scale of golf balls again, it took us about, I'm going to say about three minutes to um, get to the end of the solar system, which is, by the way, a tough topic for scientists deciding what the edge of the solar system is. We won't go there. Anyway, it took about three minutes, and it took us about 13, just shy of 14 hours to drive here. That's drive time, by the way, not including my nap last night, <laughs> which was eventful, by the way. <laughs> about 14 hours to drive here. Okay. Voyager 1, scientists believe that it reached the edge of our solar system in 2012. So that is 45 years. It took 45 years. Okay, we're, we're not on golf balls anymore. We're real time. 45 years to get to the edge of the solar system. So my final question to you. How long, if you could jump aboard Voyager 1, grab the steering wheel, and take off for Proxima Centauri, how long would it take to get there? I'm going to give you four guesses, four answers. Go ahead, pick one. I'm not going to give you the answer until you pick one, so don't be stubborn. Okay, the answer is 73,000 years. It would take 73,000 years traveling at 38,000 miles an hour <laughs> to get to the next closest star. If that didn't explode your brain, then check your pulse. All right, why did I just go through that whole thing? <laughs> well, first of all, because I had, I still have a lot of mileage and I thought I would use it for good instead of boredom. But, um, I think perspective is incredibly important for healthy living, healthy mental living. And so, um, you know, I've always drawn a lot of inspiration from astronomy. I, I really like it. I don't fully understand it all, but I, what I do understand inspires me and gives me perspective on, and I don't think there's any greater perspective than your place in the universe. And sure, some people look at a little thought experiment like that and they think to themselves, oh, life is so, we're so small and insignificant. And then they almost take on a nihilist view of existence. I go exactly the opposite route. <laughs> you know, we look at the vastness of this, this universe, this black space around us. And so far, we have not encountered other intelligent life. UFOs withstanding. I think that's grounds for being immensely grateful, excited, thankful for this valuable, invaluable thing we call life. It's incredible. And it doesn't just translate to moments, mountaintop moments. It 
you know, it, it, it can and should be part of our day-to-day -day lives. You know, simple thing. I One of the things I was really looking forward to in retirement, this is going to sound silly, but I mean it. <laughs> My son and daughter-in-law have a little dog. Her name is Sully. And she's adorable. She's a great little animal. And, and you know, being busy at work, it didn't leave me time to do simple things like go and take her for a walk a couple days a week. You know, look, the, the kids are busy. They're doing their careers. And she's at home during the day. She seems perfectly happy playing with her toys and napping. And, but I like to take her for a walk for a few days. And the other day I was just out and I was thinking about this topic of the universe. <laughs> and I just I'm overcome. Here I am just walking this dog down the street, enjoying the warmth of the sun, the beauty of changing leaves. And I just had this immense sense of gratitude for this thing we call life that is so rare and so precious. So that's it. That's why I just put you through this. We'll get to riding. Trust me. <laughs> but right now, hash brown casserole awaits. So I'll see you after that. Hey, I left out one really fun, important detail. Um, I'm going to meet Thomas. Remember Thomas? Thomas came through Delaware a little while ago. He's a fellow YouTuber. I've been watching his channel forever. If you haven't subscribed to his channel, I would encourage you to, because he rides everywhere, and he's always got a smile on his face. Anyway, he came through Delaware, and I went and met him, and we did a little riding together. Camped out, sat around the campfire, and swapped stories. It was awesome. Anyway, I told him I was coming to Florida, and, um, well, he looked at his calendar. He said, hey, how about if I ride the first day with you? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to ride today, and then, um, well, tomorrow he's going to head home, and I'm going to continue on my way. So looking forward to it. Heck of a nice guy. Sunny Florida weather this yeah. morning. Just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, what a great start. It's just at the end of a street. <laughs> awesome. Boom. We're on it. So the plans, that's the start. The plans for this trail are to go further east across all the way over to um, the Atlantic coast. I can't remember what the name of that trail is going to be, but that is the future plan. But until then, starts right there in Titusville at the end of a dead-end road on a street. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Paved trail all the way for today. Oh my gosh, this trail is so beautiful. Just for the record, Thomas is doing, teaching me birding while we're riding. <laughs> but we are not made, we are not made out of sugar. That's <laughs>
alligator? I didn't want to take a picture, but those vultures were eating an, a little alligator. Florida. I didn't grab the camera fast enough, but right back there was the turnoff that goes up to New Smyrna Beach. If you didn't want to start in Titusville, you could start in New Smyrna Beach. There's a trail. I will never remember the name of it. I'll put it right there. And you can take that and uh, come down and catch the coast to coast. going to pre-record this history segment because as I know Thomas is also a conversationalist I have this feeling I'm not even going to think about recording this during the ride so I'll be happily up here in the corner of the video for your amusement or just look at the trail it's a free country. Cape Canaveral in modern history has commonly been associated with the space program but its initial acquisition in the 40s was by the Air Force for missile testing and that was for three reasons. The area was large enough to conduct broad scale tests. It was isolated from the public and the climate is conducive to year round activity, minus the unseasonably cold weather surrounding the Challenger disaster, but that's a different video. But the bigger activity began with Kennedy's challenge to put a man on the moon before the end of the 60s. NASA kicked into full swing with three important programs, Mercury, Gemini, or Gemini as some people call it, and Apollo. Without getting into specifics, these were stepping stone programs to sequentially build expertise and confidence to eventually reach the moon. After that, the space shuttle program took front seat until its closure, and today, Cape Canaveral is the center of classified activities, but also SpaceX and Blue Origin missions. Back in March, I had the chance to watch a SpaceX launch, and it was the fulfillment of a childhood dream. If you want to learn more about the current state of Cape Canaveral, I would highly recommend the Netflix documentary, Return to Space, about SpaceX and Elon Musk. It's just fascinating. I really, really enjoyed it. So there you go. Awesome history. If you're ever looking for a fantastic family vacation experience, I can tell you my kids absolutely love visiting there. And, well, I did too. Okay, back to full screen. Today's famous person of the day is none other than Mr. Ray Charles. While he'll always be associated with Georgia. By the way, did you know that Georgia on my mind is the official state song of Georgia? I didn't, I didn't know that. Well, anyway, even though he was born in Georgia, he was raised in Florida, Greenville, Florida to be exact. I'm not gonna repeat his entire story. If you've never seen the movie Ray with Jamie Foxx, it is definitely worth watching. Um, his life was anything but simple or uncomplicated. Um, when he lost his sight as a young boy, his mother found him a place in a school for the blind in St. Augustine, where he continued to cultivate his talent as a piano player, something I understand he began at the age of three. He learned classical music through the use of braille music, where a player would learn 
the left hand movements by reading Braille with the right hand and then the right hand movements with the left hand. I think it's amazing. His early career grew around the cities of Jacksonville, Orlando, and Tampa before he burst onto the national and international scene. But his roots were right here in Florida, so that's why he is the famous person of the day. St. John's. We're going to backtrack a little bit because uh, we got to talking and, well, we kept going around the lake and we were supposed to turn <laughs> to go down to uh, I think we're plant staying in a place called Sanford, I think. Anyway, backtracking. Okay. Heading out. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Gosh, what an incredibly nice guy. <laughs> Some of you may not know, I may not explain it. You know, Thomas was on his own little Florida adventure. And, uh, well, we just timed it such that we could ride a day together. And, ah, uh, oh, what a good time. You know, it's funny, I promised at one point I would do a video on what it takes to be a good riding partner, for lack of a better term. And uh, <laughs> I could make that a really quick video. Secret to being a good riding partner is be a nice person. <laughs> That's it, be a nice person. Of which 
I have been incredibly fortunate to ride with some great people over the years, but Thomas is uh, one of the nicest. What a good guy. If you ever want to learn, well, obviously about cycling, if you want to learn about birding, if you want to learn about Amtrak, subscribe to Thomas's channel. Well, I'd suggest subscribing anyway. He is an expert, a master at all three. Boy, I hit him with so many questions over breakfast this morning. I hope it wasn't irritating. I really wanted to learn more about Amtrak. Morning. Morning. Anyway, incredibly good guy. All right, next few days are not gonna be quite as clear in terms of trails. Morning. Um, there's a lot of little twists and turns around the next few days. A couple gaps in the trail, which I will have to summon all of my mental fortitude to successfully get through those. <laughs> uh, one thing that made me feel a little bit better yesterday is Thomas got lost. Briefly he got lost. That makes me feel better when my uh, cycling idols get lost sometimes. <laughs> Morning. So um, I got a relatively short day today. I think it's just going to be about 40 miles to uh, Monteverde. Um, so, uh, you know, the rain, it rained all night and it rained very heavy for a while. So the trail's wet and there's lots of puddles, but you know, there's always a chance of rain in Florida, right? Isn't that part of Florida or at least certain parts of Florida? I don't know. I read that one city might've been Clearwater has the record for the most consecutive days of sunshine. I think it's like up in the 700s or something, some crazy number. I probably just butchered that fact. All right, well, let's get the rod. All right, this is a little fun area here. It's called Paint the Trail. And it is, uh, well, I'll show you, it's a fence. And they have painted all this fun pop culture stuff. <laughs> come this route this section there are a lot of street crossings and the the lights seem to take a long long time I feel like I'm watching my life go by I should probably be concentrating, but I'm going to risk it to bring you a famous Floridian. All right, today's famous person is a gentleman by the name of, how you doing? 
Cannonball Adderley. Cannonball Adderley was a jazz saxophonist from the bebop era. No, no doubt you've heard of Miles Davis, you've heard of John Coltrane. But Cannonball Adderley was one of the greats. He was born in Tampa, played in the Florida scene with Ray Charles and others before he went to New York and uh, played with Miles Davis. If I were stuck on a deserted island with only one record, it would be Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. I've listened to that a million times. Slight exaggeration, but many, many times. And every time I listen to it, I hear something new. Well, anyway, if you want to hear the beauty of Cannonball Adderley, go to a selection called So What? And fast forward. No, 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 don't fast forward. Strike that. Listen to the whole thing. But at about the five minute mark, Cannonball plays a solo that I think is uniquely Cannonball. He had this wonderfully just kind of liquid lyricism. Notes just floating. Ah, oh, amazing artist. I'm gonna listen to this tonight. You should do it too. You know, I said this trail was 88% complete. So, the 12% is, uh, it's confusing. I'm in one of those gaps right now. Fortunately, it's a short little gap, but you just gotta follow Google. I really don't see how they're gonna connect these trails. It's like a trail ends and another trail begins and there's a fairly significant gap in between. So this is just a few miles, but uh, people are being really aggressive, so. I'm riding on the sidewalk because, uh, well, I don't mess with two to three tons of steel. So um, I don't like it, but <laughs> I'm gonna ride on a sidewalk rather than uh, not be able to ride at all. I talked to that guy right there ahead of me. Stopped talking to him for a minute. He asked if I was doing the coast to coast, and I said, yeah, and he said, you know, I've watched tons of videos about the coast to coast. Everybody shows all the nice, neat trails, but I never seen clips about this section. <laughs> so I told him, I'm, I'm an honest rider. I will definitely show people this gap. I must have missed a part because this, I look back, this trail kept going quite a ways, so my bad. Look, a little public service announcement. You know, this trail is relatively young and they're aggressively building this and improving it. And so if you're like me and you go on YouTube and you watch a bunch of YouTube videos, just realize that the videos that were around from like three, four, five years ago, the trail is really different. My video <laughs> a year from now is probably gonna be really different. So just, just beware. Well, 
What was that? You want some history? I couldn't pass through this area without bringing up a little place that's just over there. You may have heard of it. It's called Disney World. And when I was kind of researching about this trail and looking into different stuff, I, I thought, you know, I've been to Disney World several times. Great memories with my kids, family, it was wonderful. But I thought, man, what can I learn about the history of Disney World? And I came across a video, which I will link in the description. I really want to encourage you to go look at this video. Not now, not right now. Finish this video first and then go look at this other video. Because it lays out, in Disney's own words, his vision for this area. If you've ever been to Disneyland in, in Anaheim, California, you, um, if you're like me, you're, you, you're impressed by what a small little area it is, small property. It really is, it's tiny. And uh, not the new park, there's a park next to it now. I think it's California Adventures, I think. Anyway, Disneyland, the theme park. It's small, and he's really hemmed in. I mean, the, the park is really hemmed in. So, late 50s, early 60s, Disney started buying property down here, and he was a shrewd businessman, so he was doing it under shell companies <laughs> so that nobody knew it was Disney buying it because they would have, you know, tripled the, <laughs> the asking price. But he, um, he bought a ton of land. And you know, you might think then, well, why did he buy so much land? Well, he wanted to build a big, much bigger theme park because Disneyland was so small. And well, you might be partially right if you thought that because Disney World is significantly, the Magic Kingdom is significantly bigger. But this video I want you to watch, the wild thing is Disney's vision down here was not the Magic Kingdom. It was Epcot, and, and okay, <laughs> not the Epcot that you've seen. If you've ever been down here, you've never been to Epcot. It's a, well, it's an enjoyable day, but it's sort of weird. It's a lake with like, you know, <laughs> little areas representing different countries. You can go to France and Germany and you can see what these different you know cultures are like or whatever history admirable attempt to educate Americans <laughs> on the world but that is not what his vision for Epcot was Epcot by the way stands for experimental prototype community of tomorrow tomorrow and his vision for Epcot was like a a totally planned city. It's amazing with neighborhoods and communities and you know work areas and and the citizens of Epcot would be transported to different areas. How you doing? Would be transported to work and he wanted companies to bring down state-of-the-art technology and open R&D centers and you gotta watch the video, I can't do it justice, but he was really, um, really focused on transportation. And it's something I really, I don't know, it struck me as I, I was nodding my head, is how, how much society has gone towards automobiles at the expense of pedestrians. So if you go to Disneyland, Disney World, and you see the uh, what's it called? World of Tomorrow or Age of Tomorrow. You see the people mover. You see, uh, you know, belts, walkways for people. That was his vision for this community is that you would be transported through these, these uh, vehicles and belts and, you know, and cars would become something you did outside of the city. and. Ah, uh, okay, I'm not doing it justice. Watch the video after this one. It's really amazing. And I honestly, I don't know what to think about it. When I watched this, the first thing that came to mind, for those of you in your 50s or later, 
I started thinking of Logan's run. <laughs> it, his his mock-ups and videos and pictures kind of have a, a Logan's run vibe to him. Well, just very fascinating. I had no idea. Yes, he was gonna build the Magic Kingdom in a park, but he was, his main passion was Epcot. Winter Garden, what an awesome little place. I had a very leisurely lunch and uh, yeah, what a great place. That is an awesome sign. How you doing? Morning. Wow. Miniola. Ah, bike repair station. Ah, oh, that's nice. You know, as a cyclist, when I see one of those bike stations, I feel like the community's just saying, Welcome. We love you. <laughs> How you doing? I had to sleep last night. I slept well, thanks. You know, something that's really blown me away about Central Florida is all of the lakes. I mean, I knew there was Okeechobee and some of the other big lakes. There's some big old lakes around here. This is Mineola.
<laughs> All right. I've been struggling to share this. <laughs> I promise to keep it real. You know, <laughs> what my ego wants me to do is present the image that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna admit it. I made a discovery this morning. <laughs> that discovery was since April. It's now November. I don't have the date. Mid November. Since April, I've been using chamois cream as sunblock and sunblock as chamois cream. <laughs> I bought some of those little Walgreens containers, you know, those little squeeze bottles, because I didn't want to carry a big bottle of stuff with me, and I filled them up. And I got them mixed up. So whatever advice I gave on chamois cream earlier, <laughs> you, can, you can dispense with that. And if you need any further proof that I really don't know what I'm doing, there you go. <laughs> All right, today's ride is primarily going to be part of that lost. 12% of the trail that is not done. I saw three alternatives to get to Brooksville today. Uh, one was to stay on 50. I didn't like that so much. One was to go north of 50 on old country roads but I was also told there's no shoulder whatsoever, so. <laughs> then I was told there's a little bit more adventurous route, going kind of in a, well, heading a little bit more to the south of 50, through Green Swamp. <laughs> I'm gonna try it. And I really can't say that. Because as people have told me, once you commit to this, you are committed. It is not, oh, hey, I think I'll just jump on that road right next to it. So, uh, well, looking forward to it. This will be an adventure. So hey Thomas, I, I got to ride on the Van Fleet Trail for a hundred feet. <laughs> I just crossed over.
famous person. The famous person for today is very fitting because she, she lived just a little bit north of here. Her name was Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings. If you don't rec recognize the name, I will guarantee that if you are over the age of 40, I bet you read one of her most famous books in summer reading for school. The Yearling it was also a good movie. She won a Pulitzer Prize for that book. Anyway, I'm jumping way ahead. She was born in Washington, D.C. She wanted to be a writer. So she went to University of Wisconsin at Madison, graduated, got married. She and her husband were, I think they were reporters or writers for a newspaper maybe in Rochester, New York. Well, they got the idea in their head, like a lot of people in that time, that you could just move to Florida and, you know, get a hold of some orange trees and you'd be on easy street. And they thought they could come and then, you know, they could be writers full time. And well, obviously it wasn't so easy. Well, they bought an orange grove in a little place called Cross Creek, which is the name of another one of her books. I'm reading it right now <laughs> while I'm riding this trip, which has put me in an interesting state of mind. Well, her husband wasn't terribly delighted. So they divorced and he moved away. But she stayed because she was just, felt a super deep kinship with the people in the community. How you doing? Wow, I don't know if the camera got there or not. <laughs> this is a logging road, so. Heads up. Anyway, where was I? Yes, she had a real kinship with the community. And so when you read The Yearling, characters in that book are based on real people. And the setting is real. And the things they went through in that book, the floods and pestilence and all sorts of stuff was a very real. So, uh, great book that depicts a historic period right here. Again, in a part of Florida that I just feel like people don't, I don't know, don't visit, don't see. Anyway, so Marjorie's home is now a state park and uh, millions of people go visit it to see what inspired her to uh, write the books that people have loved and cherished for years. There's a lot of hunting going on. I stopped to talk to a hunter on the side of the road there. Mostly deer and hogs, he said. Hogs! <laughs> seen a lot of deer, I've not seen any hogs yet. I'm not sure I want to see any hogs. fork in the road. Take it. A part of the placidity of the South comes from the sense of well-being that follows the heart and body warming consumption of breads fresh from the oven. We serve cold baker's bread to our enemies, trusting that they will never impose on our hospitality again.
what a fun little stop. <laughs> they had just about every kind of old soda imaginable in there. Like old brands. And then they had penny candy. So I bought a bag of Mary Janes. Not that Mary Jane. The other Mary Jane was good. So this road is closed, but super busy highway over here. There's a shoulder, but there's barrels in the shoulder, so you can't ride in it. So I'm gonna keep going on this closed road, I guess as long as I can. I just got chased by a dog. <laughs> I got to do my best barking as loud as I possibly could. I don't want to ruin my microphone, but it's pretty loud. All right, there's a fun word. Where's the coochie? State trail, I think that's where I'm going. All right, is this where I'm going? Look, I'm going to put today's ride in my top 10 favorite, most scenic sections of the journey, of life's journey. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. You know who you are, Kevin. Kevin M. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the recommendation. That was... Ah, incredibly scenic. That was just beautiful. Well, I don't have that much further to go. Uh, it's going to be about a 60 mile day. And uh, every mile was worth it. Except for a few pet sections there on 50. But got to take the good with the bad. And that was pretty, that was limited bad. For those of you that have taken 50, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Because, uh, well, the sections that I wrote on 50 were not good. Which is why I went the way I went. It's too late for a little history. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hold the camera better than I did the last two. A couple of times people said, hey man, I see too much of you and not enough of the trail. So I, I, I purposefully try to hold the camera. So if you get bored with what I'm saying, which I don't blame you, here's some more big old turtles. Look at this guy. Hey, Freddy. That was Freddy. It's the Florida turtle. All right. I don't know what I was saying. All right, yep, history. Yeah, you can't think of Florida without thinking about oranges and grapefruits. I read last night it is a $9 billion annual industry. That's a lot of money. I wouldn't mind a little piece of that. Anyway, it accounts for 93% uh, of all orange juice in the U.S. and about 65% of all citrus produce in the U.S. That's pretty big. But you know what? It wasn't always like that. Citrus trees are not indigenous to Florida. It's a great climate for them, but they didn't, they didn't just grow up naturally here. They were brought here by the Spanish in... Uh, 1500s interestingly enough citrus is not indigenous to Spain either originally comes from Southeast Asia which explains why I lived over in Singapore traveled a lot in Malaysia 
Malaysia oranges, I think, are the best in the world. Just my opinion. Anyway, up until about the mid-1800s, it was just a local crop that people consumed in Florida. And then two big changes are what made the industry what it is today. One were the railroads. You know, citrus products have a short shelf life, so when the railroads came through in the mid-1800s, you could get oranges and grapefruit all the way up the East Coast quick and people could enjoy them. A little side note, anybody else sell, sell fruit for like school? I was in the marching band. That probably explains a lot to some of you. <laughs> I used to have neighbors who used to come knock on the door and say, hey, when is that fruit sale going on again? They'd buy a crate of fruit. Anyway, all right. The trains, that was a big deal. Then in 1911, guess what was invented? The refrigerator. And then, you know, oranges and fruit could last longer. And they created this amazing thing called fruit concentrate. Which if you were like me, I, I never tasted real orange juice. I don't know when I tasted real orange juice. It's always Minute Maid concentrate. That's eh, not bad. It's just, you know, whatever. And then it turned into the industry it is today. It is a uh, rough industry. There have been freezes, especially in the northern section of Florida, that have almost wiped out the crops completely, which has caused the the industry itself to move further further south but the other thing is bugs and pestilence and i love that word pestilence what a great word there's something going on in the citrus industry right now i don't understand i was reading it last night it's called hlb and it is some kind of virus that has been around i think for like 20 years now and they can't figure it out and it's bad, really bad. And there's one very doom and gloom website last night that was saying that if they don't get this settled, figured out, the citrus industry could be gone in less than a decade. I don't take those reports super serious, but hey, scientist, we wish you well. And then, of course, there's hurricanes and other stuff, but. Next time you drink a little Florida orange juice, which you got about a 93% chance of whatever orange juice you're drinking came from here, think about the history of this great industry. Sorry, one fun fact. If you took the annual orange crop, boxed it up in the crates, lined up the crates, they would stretch from Miami to Los Angeles. You know, when I share little facts and things, I hope you know I'm not just fabricating this stuff out of thin air. I, I, you know, I do a respectable amount of research. And when I make mistakes, you know, generally, it's because I learned something wrong years ago. Like, Wapakoneta, Ohio is not in northeastern corner of Ohio. That's something I just, I, I, I can't even say that I mislearned it. I know better. I've been to Wapakoneta. It is in Western Central Ohio. Ah, anyway. And yes, Orville, Ohio is spelled with two R's. That's from another video. <laughs> that's, I'm sorry, that's from another video clarifying mistakes made in another video. For those of you not familiar with this channel. 
Which leads me to some subscriber suggested taglines for this channel. They didn't submit them as taglines. I just, I've been always thinking of a tagline and one person said, fun videos and slightly more accurate than Wikipedia. <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. But I think my favorite, I gotta remember the exact word. I think the person said, highly entertaining and somewhat informative. <laughs> I think that's really good. I think that goes to the front of the line for taglines. And uh, hey, I aspire to be accurate, okay? But, uh, well, mistakes are made. Yeah. Ah, about 20 minutes ago, I got onto this trail and I opened up my app and there was no blue dot. I had no bars. So, I did not appear on the map. And everything in my brain said, yeah, just turn right and keep going. And I, that was the, that was the wrong way. So guess what I'm enjoying today? I'm enjoying the Withlacoochee Trail. Fortunately, I feel really good today. I've had like three nights of sleep in a row that have been fantastic and I feel very energetic so little detour no biggie see wasn't that far off I'm right back where I made my wrong turn a quick tip for videographers if you make a wrong turn and you go way out of your way just view a couple clips and nobody will really know they'll think you were just like off course for like a mile This is where I thought I was before. The Good Neighbor Trail. I like the name of this trail a lot. Yes, here we are. I was mentioning there's a lot of construction cool really great construction going on for this trail here's a good example it, it they're building a bridge 
up over coming down here that'll be really nice hey first things first good morning how are you today you know one of the joys of <laughs> for me at least bike touring is the sleep that accompanies a long day's ride. <laughs> I have slept four nights in a row, like super deep. Fantastic. So two things. When I came in on the trail yesterday, you know, I was looking at the path and I was like, wow, this is so like, so clean and so uh, there's just nothing on the trails no debris it was incredible and I you know I start coming with all sorts of weird ideas in my head like ah maybe it's the ocean breeze or and of course there's no ocean golf anywhere around here well it is a breeze actually <laughs> it's just created by a leaf blower last night the Airbnb I stayed at High stars, by the way. The host, Larry, I talked to him this morning. Heck of a nice guy. He gets out there and volunteers and uh, blows all the crap off the trail. Hence, <laughs> why it was so amazing yesterday. So, hey Larry, big kudos, respect man. Thank you for volunteering and doing that. Great trail. All right, second thing. Every once in a while, you know, my dear little wife, she sees me in the office working on a video like this. And she gets that kind of curious expression and says, why, why, do you, why are you doing this? Well, yesterday was a prime example of why I do this. I mentioned kudos to a guy named Kevin who gave me a very, very detailed route to uh, go through the green swamp yesterday, which as I sat last night thinking about the day, again, was one of the, ah, one of the best riding segments ever. It was, it was really fantastic. So scenic and, well, anyway, I won't repeat that. Go back and watch it again if you want to take it in a second time. By the way, you can watch videos more than once. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what I failed to mention about Kevin was that he also right now is on the coast to coast. He's going west to east. So we happened to overlap last night in Brooksville and uh, met up and had dinner. And, uh, well, <laughs> that is why I make YouTube videos. To meet someone like that and have a night of swapping stories and laughing about stuff and talking about trails and, well, Kevin, you're a heck of a nice guy. And uh, I really enjoyed it really enjoyed the conversation how nice there's a kinship among bike tour people that I, uh, I have always appreciated and well Kevin you're one of the best so thanks buddy great time all right well today I'm off to Tarpon Springs which is 50 50 and change away and um, it's a beautiful day gonna have some sunshine but apparently gonna have sunshine the rest of this trip next two days so that will be really nice temperatures in the mid 70s looking forward to it how you doing Yes. Google is 
taking me this way? Google, where are we going? <laughs> Google. Come on, Google. Aw, Google. Google, come on. Google, what you doing, man? Come on. <laughs> yeah, this is where I was at. Right, just for the record, Google keeps telling me to go right back to that same road. <laughs> yeah, keeps telling me, take a U-turn, go back, go back to that road. <laughs> All right, here's the trail. Google, why are you having a fit? Here's the trail, Google. I can't believe it, I'm talking to Google. Oh yeah, yeah, now, now we're, now we're going the right way. What a touching little memorial here. Beautiful. What a nice way to remember people. <laughs> wow, I started getting kind of misty eye. <laughs> a lot of really beautiful poems and uh, memories of people. That's really nice. ran into a fellow ragbriar. I forgot I was wearing my ragbri shirt. <laughs> oh, that was that was 20 minutes well spent. Nice guy. All right, what what is this segment going to be? I guess this is a frequently asked question. frequently asked questions I get is do I say hello to everybody on the trail do I say good morning or wave to everybody and the answer to that is yes <laughs> I say hello to about 99% of the people on the trail and the 1% I don't I feel bad about it <laughs> why well it goes back to uh, one of my earliest memories is my grandfather. My grandfather lived in a little town in Kentucky, about an hour away, so I was fortunate. I got to spend a lot of time with, with him and my grandmother. Good people. I think my grandfather, well, still to this day, I think he's one of the wisest people I ever knew. The older I get, the more, and my theory is, <laughs> wisdom is directly proportional to people who are in connection with the land. And not in a, you know, metaphysical, conceptual way, but uh, really in touch with the land. I used to watch him bend down and pick up a handful of dirt and watch the way he'd look at it and feel it in his hands. and. Yeah, something magical there. Well, anyway, what the hell am I talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, saying good morning to people. So, 
one day I was going for a walk with him and and uh, we were walking the sidewalk and a person came the other way and they said how to do and you know I was a little smart ass kid I'm still pretty much a smart ass and my grandfather was well I didn't say anything I just stared ahead and he was mortified and he looked at me and said now Brian and he was a man of few words so when he said now Brian you listen you better you better perk up well anyway he said now Brian and by the way my first name in the south is one syllable Brian he said Brian you always acknowledge people always say hello to people always and especially strangers because i said well i don't know who that is and he's like it doesn't make any difference he was a deeply religious man and i remember him quoting a bible verse to me and boy i don't think I'd, I'd have to look for this one about how you should be always be friendly to strangers because some people have uh entertained angels yeah well you know I was three four years old uh, heck I want to be nice to angels <laughs> so anyway my god am I ever gonna get to the point okay <laughs> I'm sorry this is the way I tell stories my apologies all right fast forward a couple weeks ago I decided to Google is there some benefit is there is there a uh, psychological or physiological benefit to saying good morning to people and Google never lets you down well the mapping feature certainly does but I found this article well there were a lot of silly articles but then I found a, like a scholarly article you know the kind with three and four syllable words in it I gotta take a break after a few pages of that. But, how you doing? There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, so I'm skimming through this article. You don't have to read it, I'll summarize it for you. It did a study of, how you doing? It did a study of people in an office setting and it hooked up you know wires and stuff to them and measured uh, hormone levels in their system and you have to kind of look at stress and and positives and negatives what people experience in an office setting and they notice these little blips of you know happy hormones like oxytocin and dopamine and endorphins and, you know that kind of stuff stuff that makes you feel good and uh, and they when they went back and looked at it well lo and behold these little blips little spikes were from the person gets in the office people look at one another and say good morning they go to a meeting the person says how you doing good to see you how's it going Pass somebody in the hall. How you doing? And then, conversely, they notice other little releases of stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. And those are correlated with, you know, you walk in a meeting, everybody's talking, you say hello, and nobody says anything back to you. Or you, you know, you look at somebody, they don't acknowledge you're there. The research paper showed that saying good morning to somebody is more than just acknowledging the condition of a time of day. <laughs> One of our deepest seated needs is to belong. So these scientists were correlating that every time you do that, every time you acknowledge somebody, you look them in the eye, you smile, you wave, you're communicating something much deeper. You're communicating. Hey, I see you. And 
I acknowledge you and you know we belong <laughs> you know we're alive together we're on this planet we're it's much deeper than you may think and when you don't do it it, it, it releases stress and defensiveness and even fear I remember many years ago I lived overseas and uh, well while I was overseas the first Gulf War broke out and people in the community were kind of looking at me differently like mmm and uh, staring at me not acknowledging me not saying good morning <laughs> and I I remember going through a period of a lot of stress of feeling like wow I don't belong you know this is this is a little scary so well anyway there you go a little science on a Sunday morning I said that was a fact that might have been a mind-blowing mind-blowing facts I can't remember what the name of the segment is now anyway next time you pass somebody on the trail think all the good you're doing when you look at them and smile and wave it's worth it morning <laughs> okay right there my system just said something's wrong <laughs> that woman didn't even acknowledge I existed <laughs> <laughs> oh man my cortisol rate just went up all right let's see if this one's better morning all right she smiled and said hi you may not have heard it it was a little it was a little high hi. so as you know I've been compiling massive amounts of data into uh, bikers my uh, computer system back at the command center and uh, you know I found over time that about 80% of people will acknowledge if you say hello good morning good afternoon you wave about 80% will respond in kind of course a hundred percent of Missourians and Iowans they all say hello and and they do it earnestly But uh, yeah, on this trail yesterday, I think I went five straight, no acknowledgement. And I did, I felt bad. <laughs> Just felt like, what, what's going on? Am I invisible? Ah, well. trail this looks beautiful recently resurfaced bike trail good I'm on the bike trail apparently How you doing? Hi. <laughs> you can always count on trike riders to say hello. Those are the happiest people on the planet. All right. <laughs> Look at this sign. Oh, can you see it? It says Pluto. This must be a scale model of the solar system. <laughs> so, well, let's let's do it. Let's do a twofer. We're gonna. We're gonna ride, I guess, to the sun. There's Uranus. <laughs> All right, 
Mars. Earth. Venus. Mercury. Wow, okay. This is a rather condensed view. And the sun. Okay, if you purposefully want to mess with your brain, <laughs> go for a bike ride in, you know, in the interior of Florida. Stop at a market, have a beer, or not, whatever. And uh, sit and listen to Christmas music for a half an hour. <laughs> kind of like, where am I right now? What's going on? What am I doing? All right, I got about an hour to go. And uh, boy, what a beautiful day. All right, I'm gonna be honest with you. I kind of wish I wouldn't have brought up the whole good morning thing. Because since I opened my yap, I'm batting about 200, which is well below my Observed average to date. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm not like losing faith in humanity or anything, but wow, I've been like invisible today. <laughs> That's a horrible feeling, honestly. All joking aside, you ever had that when somebody just looks through you like you don't, you're not even there? I had an executive do that one time years ago. And I confronted him, maybe to my own peril, uh, <laughs> about, hey man, don't do that again. That's a terrible, terrible thing to do to somebody. <laughs> Just look through them like they're invisible. All right, I have a battle inside of oxytocin and cortisol. They're battling it out, but I know who's gonna win. I know. All right, what are we dealing with here? Are we on a new trail? This is Pinellas County. Is this the Pinellas Trail? I don't think so. <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> oh, these two ladies just came out to explain that they're well, what they're trying to do. That's very nice. <laughs> Almost at the end here, but I thought I would mix together today famous people and history. Can I do that? All right, today's historical figure it's a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Green. If you don't recognize the name, well, I didn't either. You know, sometimes I understand what Alex Trebek felt like. You can be the smartest person in the world if you're standing there with the, with the answer card. <laughs> All right, Mr. Green was a soldier in World War II. He was served in South Pacific and he was distressed by what he and his fellow soldiers went through with just the beating sun burning blistering their skin and so he concocted this thing called red ved pep or pet RVP and it was it was red and it had the consistency of uh, like Vaseline. And uh, his soldiers started putting it on. He was bald, so he tested it on his own head. And, uh, and it worked. Now he was not the first person to do this. 
The founder of L'Oreal, I think, was probably one of the first. And then there was a guy named Franz, uh, I won't remember his name, Geiter, Greiter, Greeter, something like that. He developed something called Glacier Cream. And, you know, these were low SPF type products, but, you know, they alleviated some of the issue. Well, Mr. Green came back and uh, kept messing around with his formula, added some cocoa butter, coconut oil, and, uh, well, he founded a little company by the name of Coppertone. And I don't know about you, I'm old enough to remember. <laughs> Do you remember when we used to call it suntan lotion? <laughs> I think I went into a store on vacation one time and asked them where their suntan lotion was. <laughs> Heck, I don't know, what's SPF up to now? Like a thousand? Hundred? Well, anyway, there you go. Benjamin Green, uh, oh, I forgot, He's a, he was a native of Miami. So he's our famous Floridian of the day. Is it over? All right, good news, it's not over. beautiful morning it is upper 60s sunny so uh, I am on my way to oh man I don't know the name of the little town because I'm going to meet yet another rider subscriber this morning I mentioned I was coming down here and gonna ride this so some people reached out and this gentleman Hans uh, wanted to meet up and ride well, ride down to, uh, I'm gonna end the day at Treasure Island. I've been advised that going all the way into St. Petersburg is, morning, is not, uh, not required. <laughs> Apparently a lot of stop and go. So I'm gonna end the day at, at uh, Treasure Island and Hans, I guess he lives nearby. So we're gonna ride together. I'm always looking forward to that. Which leads to a question, people said, aren't you scared? of, you know, meeting an axe murder or something, and well, I respond with that age-old joke. What's the probability of us both being axe murderers? Okay, the other thing I'm gonna do is, uh, morning, is uh, record my, morning, is record my famous people. Today's famous person, I'm gonna play to the 50 and older crowd, purposefully. Morning is uh, Tampa native, Slim Whitman. <laughs> if you don't know who Slim Whitman is, well, you're just not old enough. Again, Slim Whitman is from Tampa. He originally wanted to be either a boxer or a baseball player. And not in the way that, you know, little kids are like, I wanna be an astronaut. He was a legit baseball player. He played in the minor leagues back in the 40s. He was a left-handed pitcher. Must've been pretty good. He batted in the upper, like 360, 370. And he led him to a pennant. I don't remember the name of the team. But it was his voice 
that uh, people knew him more from. Boy, there's a well-constructed grammatical sentence. And it literally saved his life in one case. He served in World War II in the Navy. And uh, he so entertained the uh, crew on the ship he was serving on that the captain blocked a transfer to another ship, which sadly was attacked, sank, and the whole crew was killed. Uh, but anyway, his voice saved his life, literally. But if you don't know who Slim Whitman is, you can look it up on YouTube. I'll put a link below. He was, he was a good singer. He had a unique style. He was like a, some people called it yodeling. Morning. Yodeling, it wasn't like serious yodeling. He just had that falsetto, you know, upper register. Country singer, gospel singer. But he did something that was unique back in the 80s. He released a, a record called, I think it was something completely innocuous, like, you know, Slim Whitman's Greatest Hits or something. And then he created an infomercial. And he built this incredible amount of hype around this record that was like, you know, like it was some super, super popular international hit. And it was just a record. <laughs> it was so awesome. I remember it was on the same time every day. Morning. And, uh, and I would race home from school. My buddies and I would do our best. Good morning. Would do our best uh, Slim Whitman impressions. <laughs> so Slim, look, man, you added to my high school enjoyment. So today is dedicated to you. Morning. Sorry, I left out one funny <laughs> thing about Slim Whitman. If the writers of the movie Mars Attack did him wrong. <laughs> you ever seen the movie, you know? It, well, in the end, what defeated the Martians was they played Slim Whitman's famous hit, Indian Love Call, and it made their heads explode. <laughs> funny, funny, but we still, morning, we still uh, respect you, Slim. I'm hoping this is part of the trail because I really want to go up over this bridge. How you doing, man? You? Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Hans. Yeah, Hans. How you doing? You need a break? No, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. 
Marcel Proust wrote, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Hans led me on a beautiful ride down the Gulf coastline. It was an incredibly beautiful day, a day where I sort of just wanted to keep pedaling, keep going, anything but stop. My purpose in coming to Florida was that I desperately wanted to see new things. Florida is a land of such diverse scenery, like hidden treasures around each corner. Lakes, swampland, green springs, amazing wildlife. Add to that the privilege of meeting other adventurers along the way, travelers with huge smiles and a shared awe of the path as it unfolds mile by mile. How could I possibly encapsulate the sights, smells, sounds of the journey? the gathering of memories that will most certainly return home with me. The grit in my gears. My skin at one moment warmed under clear blue skies, then drenched by downpours. Regardless, warmed by that invaluable gift of new eyes to see our place in a vast landscape that welcomes us to take it all in. People always ask what's next, and this time, I really don't. I truly squeezed everything I could out of the fall, but winter is definitely coming. 2023 has been an incredible year of adventure on a personal level. And, well, I've got the videos to prove it. <laughs> and I already started compiling a list for next year. By the way, thanks for all of your suggestions and recommendations. It's funny, but sometimes I think my life is turning into either riding, watching videos about riding, or planning on riding. For now, thanks for coming along on this journey. I hope your holidays are wonderful and your coming year is full of beauty, meaning, and adventure. Be good to one another and see you soon.